President Donald Trump's travel ban went into effect this week. It was enacted after a legal victory at the Supreme Court. The justices allowed a modified version of the ban to move forward and we'll hear the full case later this year. The court clearly went in a different direction than the lower courts had and really upheld in a very significant way the president's constitutional and statutory power here. What does this mean for the states that have challenged the president over his executive order? Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum joins us to discuss. Also tonight, a potential challenger to Governor Kate Brown next year. The Republican mayor of Happy Valley, Lori Chavez de Reamer, talks about her political ambitions. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Hard to believe, but it won't be long before another election season starts up and we're hearing about possible candidates for Oregon governor. Later in the show, we'll meet Happy Valley's mayor, a Republican who says she's considering a run for Oregon's top job. But first, a revised version of President Trump's travel ban took effect late this week after the U.S. Supreme Court allowed parts of the executive order barring citizens from six majority Muslim countries. The ban took effect despite the efforts of several states to block it, including Oregon. So where does that fight go from here? Here to shed some light on that, welcome to my guest, Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. Welcome to Straight Talk, it's nice to have you here. Thank you for having me back, Laurel. So the Supreme Court decided to hear arguments on President Trump's travel ban affecting those six mostly Muslim countries. That'll be heard in the fall, but as of right now, the court allowed parts of the president's contentious executive order to take effect with some exemptions. Were you surprised by the Supreme Court ruling given the lower court rulings? Oh, not really. I think the Supreme Court wanted to find a way to uh, kind of, uh, you know, I hate to use the term, but split the baby a little bit. And so that's really what they did. But for the most part, I see it as a continuation of the ban with respect to um, Oregon, at least, ex excuse me, a continuation of the stay of the ban, at least with respect to Oregon. Well, I think we're going to be seeing, uh, for the most part, the people that wanted to be able to come to Oregon, hopefully will be able to under the various exceptions that the Supreme Court set forth. Let's take a look at, at what that ban would do. Uh, the Trump administration will in most cases be able to enforce its 90 day ban on travelers from these six countries, Iran, Yemen, Sudan, <clears throat> Syria, Somalia, and Libya. One category of foreigners protected those with a credible claim of a bona fide relationship with a person or entity in the U.S. The Supreme Court will hear the full case in October. So you said, like, split the baby. So do you think that this was a, a pragmatic middle ground? Does it, does it satisfy some of your constitutional concerns? Yeah, well, first of all, I think that that bona fide relationship is going to be applied to most of those who it, uh, were planning on uh, coming to this country, even from those six countries, as well as refugees who will also be permitted from other countries if they fit those qualifications. So I am satisfied that uh, we can pretty much move forward as we already were doing. I also think that you need to pay close attention to the opinion, which I've read and brought with me, and because I think what the Supreme Court really wants to see happen is to have that executive review that really hasn't taken place yet. That is the whole basis, that was the primary basis uh, in the first place, really, and should have just been what, what the president did without even imposing this uh, really uh, kind of demeaning and insulting ban on individual people. Could have just gone right ahead and done the review, uh, the so-called extreme vetting, uh, hey, it's vetting, let them do that, that's appropriate for a new administration to do. And so I think that's where the Supreme Court's headed here. So I don't see um, really this as even necessarily going to the full Supreme Court in the fall, we'll see. There's some, so it could be a moot point because the administration wants, it says it wants 90 days for the State Department that's to right. review these travelers coming from these countries. By the time the court hears it in October, the 90 days will be up. Right, and if you read the opinion carefully, you can see that actually they're really only giving 70 days because there's a 20-day period for the review to take place, and then there's another 50-day period referenced, uh, which I hadn't remembered, but uh, that 50 days is to get the various um, agencies to provide the information uh, back to the administration that's necessary in order to proceed with the 
uh, issuing of visas. So uh, I'm not as troubled by this as uh, one might think. Um, the lower courts have declared, uh, at least the Fourth Circuit, has ruled on a constitutional basis, on the basis that it's discrimination, on the basis of religion, a violation of the Establishment Clause. The Ninth Circuit, our circuit, has ruled on the basis of a statutory violation. I don't see that uh, there's anything in this opinion to suggest that the Supreme Court, if it gets to those substantive issues, wouldn't uh, make findings that are consistent with those. In this ruling, there's so, some room for interpretation on what a bona fide relationship is and just late this week, mm -hmm. Hawaii issued an emergency challenge uh, to how the administration is defining bona fide. It's right. very narrow, they say. Is there a right. chance that Oregon would, would also file a challenge in that regard? Well, you know, um, I'm, I was really glad to see that Attorney General Chin had filed that uh, with, the, uh, with the judge in, in Hawaii, which of course is where the Ninth Circuit case um, arose. We have a Washington case that we're a part of, so it's a little, com a little confusing, but the Washington case that we're a part of is currently on hold while the Hawaii case goes forward. So it's appropriate for uh, A.G. Chin to be doing that. We may j well join. We could file an amicus brief with the court. What he's trying to do is to clarify uh, what the court's uh, interpretation would be of what the Supreme Court ruling is because in the meantime you didn't mention the cable that was sent by the Department of the State Department to all of the consular agencies around the world to ensure that their interpretation that is the administration's interpretation of the judge's ruling would um, would go forward and uh, A.G. Chin and I uh, believe there's actually been some misunderstanding by the State Department as to what uh, bona fide relationship would be. I don't know how much in the weeds you want me to get on that, well, but you well, know. What, what do you think it is? Well, as an example, the, um, the categories of family, uh, the Supreme Court talked about close familial relationships and even talked about uh, the actual individuals in Hawaii, one of whom was a, an in-law. And so in-laws are included, but grandparents are not included. Uh, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like, if, especially if your gran grandmother raised you, uh, shouldn't your grandmother, even more than your in-law, be somebody who should be admitted into the country? So I think there's some clarification needed. Uh, nieces and nephews and um, some other relatives are not included by the State Department's cable that was sent out. So that's just one example. Uh, and I think there are others as well regarding uh, some of those with no contacts at all, other than communication with uh, resettlement programs, immigration organizations. I think there's an issue there as to at what point there is a relationship that kicks in. There's enough of a contact that kicks in such that the bona fide uh, relationship standard has been met. So those are the kinds of things that the judge in Hawaii, Judge Watson, will be taking a look at. And yes, we may very well, we haven't decided, but we may uh, get involved in a uh, amicus, uh, which is a friend of friend the court. Of the court. Uh, we don't necessarily have to become a party in order to to be a part of the lawsuit if we can serve in that re in that capacity. This has been the biggest legal controversy during President Trump's five months in office. It sparked confusion, <laughs> widespread protests, also right. at at the Portland airport just days after the president took office. Right. As a tour, uh, Oregon's attorney general, you joined a lawsuit this year with Washington State against the ban. Let me ask you, President Obama issued many executive orders. There are those who say a travel ban like this issued by President Obama or really any other president might not have had the same strong pushback from the courts that this has. The courts might have seen it well within the president's constitutional authority. Why the robust effort to challenge President Trump's authority on this travel ban? This ban was tainted from the beginning, and it still is. And that's because of all the things that uh, candidate Trump said during his campaign and then confirmed and affirmed after he became president. And so our position has been and continues to be that the, the ban is a Muslim ban, that it's discriminatory, that is mean-spirited, and that is in violation of both the Constitution and statutes. So it's very different from other executive orders that are not unconstitutional and that are not based upon clear intent, clear intent to discriminate, which is what we have here.
On a, real, a related note uh, on sanctuary cities, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has defended a new Texas law that punishes sanctuary cities. It would punish law enforcement officials who don't cooperate with federal immigration agents. Oregon, of course, is a sanctuary state. It has been on the books for 30 years. Many Oregon cities like Portland have reaffirmed their status as sanctuary cities, but the Trump administration and Attorney General Sessions have threatened to crack down on sanctuary cities and to pull federal funding from those who don't comply with federal immigration law. Is Oregon on solid ground in resisting the federal government on this? Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's constitutional arguments that we'll be making that have already been made. In California, the city of Santa Clara down in California has already been successful. Uh, you know, we're not Texas. Uh, and, you know, it's a lovely state, but uh, the, law, the laws in Texas that get passed uh, in lots of areas are an anathema to Oregon and to what we stand for here in terms of being a uh, welcoming and inclusive state. So I am pretty confident not only that what we currently have will be upheld, but I'm really hopeful that a bill, uh, House Bill 3464, uh, will soon uh, go through the Senate. It's already gone successfully. And this is the Oregon the, bill. This is an Oregon bill that would actually enhance uh, our sanctuary state status by protecting uh, individuals from uh, with the privacy of their inf of their personal information. It would uh, prevent uh, personal information such as a person's address, a person's workplace, their hours of work, their school, and their school hours from being provided solely for the purpose of immigration enforcement. So we're actually working uh, to actually strengthen our sanctuary state law that has been on the books in Oregon since 1987. So that's passed the House, but not the Senate so far. That's right. It's in Senate rules right now. The federal government recently closed its investigation into alleged influence peddling involving former Governor Kitzhaber and his fiancee, Sylvia Hayes, and said it would not file criminal charges. Is that the outcome you expected? Not necessarily at the beginning, two years ago, but since that time, more than two years ago, actually, uh, February of 2015 was when the investigation began, the federal investigation began. Since then, there's been a very significant federal court ruling that I think once that came down, which is about a year ago. That was involving the Virginia That's governor. right, involving the Virginia governor, uh, but really um, had a major impact, I think, on pending uh, corruption cases. And so once that case came down, frankly, I don't think anybody uh, I, the only surprise was that it took the feds as long as it did to make the decision after that decision came down, but they still had a lot to do. They had a lot of, of documents to go through, and I appreciate that they did a careful review. We only have about 45 seconds left, but I want to touch on, uh, on your investigation with the DOJ in Oregon. You dropped your investigation uh, in February and deferred to the feds. The Oregonian reported last week newly released documents revealed federal authorities were uncomfortable about possible conflicts of interest in your office since your office also had the duty to represent kids Kitzhaber's office and other state officials, and it could undermine the federal investigation. Is that why you dropped the investigation? No, we dropped the investigation because we were uh, asked, first of all, we deferred the investigation. We didn't actually drop it until just this past February when the statute of limitations would have run by then. But uh, we deferred uh, out of deference to, at the time, U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall, who made the request. Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum, thank you for joining us here on thank Straight you. Talk. Thank you. Thanks for having to have me. You back. We'll hope you come back again soon. And when we come back, we talk with Happy Valley Mayor Lori Chavez Dreamer, who says Oregon needs new leadership and she's up to the task. Why she's thinking about running for governor. We're back in two minutes.